Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, I know some of you are still, and you can continue to clang your plates and, uh, and partake in desserts and so forth here, but we've packed a lot into our little space. We want to give this outstanding panel an opportunity to uh, share the wisdom with all of you. So what we're doing this afternoon again, and transitioning a bit, we've heard this morning from a stellar group of practitioners all the way through lunch to frame the, essentially some of the challenges that the folks who are on the front lines of dealing with this have shared with us, and also based on long and distinguished careers of, of, of dealing with challenges uh, over those decades. Now we're shifting gears a bit to the research community that's involved with wrestling many of these issues. But but we've asked each of the panelists who are up here to essentially share, based on their expertise, what are some of the challenges, some of the, 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 the imperatives that we should be addressing if we're successful around these barriers that I laid out at the very outset. So again, we're going to start here with this challenge of if we, we can't become resilient if we don't know what we're resilient against and what we're trying to make resilient. And so we broadly put that under risk literacy. We've also said, okay, we've got to propagate that. So we're going to have to find some way to communicate it and educate in order for people to be willing to understand that risk and be a part of the solution. Well then, our second panel, which will be following this one, will be focused on, all right, how do we think about design, both at the macro level, like regional planning, urban planning, down to the, apply, down to the uh, um, asset level, potentially building and structured engineering. How do we tackle those sets of issues? And then we're gonna finish, a little bit that you heard certainly play out our practitioner panel is that it turns out things like governance and politics matter in this whole thing, and it turns out that how we think about incentives that will get people to adopt ideally quickly and scale, those are real challenges. And so we have to really try to bound that set of issues as well. We're gonna then end up concluding the afternoon with some closing sort of comments from a couple of practitioners from Washington who essentially have been listening to what we've been saying and saying this is a little bit what their takeaway is. We hope that's a kind of a sample of what maybe other folks and other governments might take away as well. But it's helped to sort of frame that what we're trying to do here is ultimately, of course, a call to action, you know, a collective uh, mobilization of capability to actually make a, build, a, a more resilient world. Um, I wanted to just in this very short period, six minutes, to uh, throw out some ideas about risk and education or risk in the public affairs piece, how people understand risk and, uh, and where it fits in resilience. Um, and there was well, something said earlier today that really struck me, which was a comment about preparing for anything versus preparing for something. And for me, the risk uh, and risk management process that we've adopted internationally tends to draw us into preparing for something. So we think about hazard mapping for earthquake or for wildfire or whatever that disruptive challenge is that you're concerned about. But of course today, as all of you know better than I do, um, much of the problem that we're seeing relates to complex systems, interconnections, cascading consequences, unexpected outcomes that are not necessarily to do with whether it was a flood or a fire or something else that you were concerned about. Uh, so our risk system at some level, which serves us so well every day, in every business, in every community, during every emergency, I don't want to throw that out, but I do want us to think more about complexity, as I know many of you do, and also about uh, some of the more the emerging concepts, complexity risk, the idea that a complex system itself generates some risk because it's complex, in addition to the other factors that, that affect it. So it seemed to me in my uh, health and medical uh, space uh, that we were often looking in the risk system for what we would call the magic bullet. I don't know if that's a term that you're familiar with, but the idea that there's a treatment, that there's a pill that we will discover that will solve that problem, whereas resilience and risk isn't like that. It's, it's far more complicated. And then in the communication space, in the public affairs space, one of the stories that um, I like to tell about the experience of Australia was the enormous flooding that occurred for us in the state of Queensland uh, in about 2010-2011. Uh, uh, we saw Queensland flooded to the extent that an area two and a half times the size of Texas, for those of you that are living here, uh, or the size of France and Germany combined, underwater. So that's a very, very big event. 
with all of the, the usual uh, uh, difficulties and uh, um, fallout of that kind of event. But the thing that really struck me was that a year or two later, it rained again. And people in Queensland who had been flooded previously, some of them were flooded again and may not have taken any preparations and many of them had not taken out flood insurance. And the rationale for that was that the government, the public media was talking about the Queensland flooding as a one in 200 year event. And we had it last year. So it isn't gonna happen again, not in my lifetime. And of course the statistics don't work like that, do they? Uh, but for the general public, there is that sense that the way in which we communicate to people causes them to think, um, well, to interpret uh, their risk differently. So risk and communication are a, a, a problem in this space that I'd want us to continue to pursue. The other um, set of issues associated with that for me is that then often the fixes for risk that we adopt are based on technology and infrastructure development. They are about building stronger structures or stronger systems in terms of technology that will help us to survive the event next time. And the recurring theme in our space uh, in terms of why that's problematic is that it's truly a more social and political problem than a technological one. So you can have the fix but having people understand the fix, use the fix, promote the fix, that's a social and political problem. And that's a set of issues that I think in Australia, at least, we deal with less well. You know, we can rebuild bridges, we can reconstruct the internet, all those things are easy, um, truly easy. Um, but getting community support, uh, getting funding for development that lasts longer than the recovery period, so that truly is development funding for the period between one disaster and the next, those things are difficult to do. So again, that's a little bit about risk and it's a lot about public communication and communication with policy makers and politicians and our whole governance process around how we build a more resilient um, uh, community. And then the third aspect that I wanted to mention in terms of risk uh, and what I think is new um, is that we are increasingly seeing, as I think people are around the world, the impact of events that happen somewhere else. So the problem of global interconnectedness and dependencies on supply chains, logistics, uh, and so on. Uh, and so in Australia, we're at the very, as you would understand, at the far end of a logistics chain. Uh, the next place after us is Antarctica. Somebody mentioned Antarctica before. Um, it's in my neighbourhood. And... Um, <laughs> But Indonesia, which is just north of us, is a country uh, where, as I've said to our Indonesian colleague, uh, almost every disaster happens every year. Uh, there are volcanoes. It is on the Ring of Fire around the Western Pacific. Uh, volcanoes and earthquakes and tsunamis and so on are a risk. Large volcanic eruption in Indonesia threatens Australia's supply chain. Now that may sound um, like something that you could readily deal with, but given that much of that supply chain is, uh, is air travel, uh, is aerial, um, and some of it is shipping through Singapore, most of our fuel is in fact kept in Singapore, which is north of Indonesia, if you know your geography, uh, and supplied to Australia. We keep about 15 days of fuel supply in Australia, um, which is below the OECD recommendation, but hey. Um, and you can see so those kinds of incidents start to affect us. But also at the general community level they affect us because um, if you're employed, for example, in selling motor vehicles um, or repairing them and there's flooding in Asia that takes out car plants and reduces the supply of the widget that you need to run your business, you may be out of work for a period of time. So we're seeing those kind of global connections that are more and more concerning, I think, uh, to us in Australia uh, in terms of how we deal with them and build some kind of robustness. Now again, for me, that's a social and political issue because it's about investment in redundancy, it's about investment in the kind of caches of supply of essential uh, services that we need, and it's in how we build the resilience of what we would describe as the essential societal systems 
terminology you've probably heard before. There are various ways of describing that. But you know how we manage to maintain transport and communications and health and public health and education, public safety, government, all those pieces of the puzzle that provide a safe and healthy community every day, but, but certainly during emergencies. So those things are important. And then just finally, I wanted to say something about um, the balance between uh, the slow burn emergencies or the slow burn disruptions is a better way of thinking about it, and how we get that conversation outside of emergency management and into those government departments and organisations and NGOs that deal with other areas, be they agriculture, be they child development, whatever they might be, so that this conversation of resilience is not only in the hands of emergency managers, but in the hands of those that have the levers that might be able to make a difference. So that part is important. And secondly and finally, the piece about what are the really scary things that are emerging as threats that we might also uh, focus on. We in our university last week um, have been working with the World Health Organisation uh, on a piece of work around the international response to the deliberate use of biological agents uh, to attack communities. So that's a relatively scary, very finite and focused problem. But one of those emerging threats that you see come out of the more ready availability of genetic engineering, the fact that in your back shed now, you can create a new organism if you want, possibly not as well as a national state actor could, but nonetheless, uh, these are emerging sorts of threats uh, that we should also be thinking about. So that's my canvas. Um, if anyone's interested in any of those ideas, happy to talk about them um, and uh, really interested to see what you have to say. So I, I think, let me, you said something at the beginning that um, will help me not to have to talk too much about it and issues that this is complex and therefore whatever we say is pretty incomplete. Um, but let me add something related to your question, and it has to do with one of our problems as researchers and probably as experts is that we are experts in particular disciplines. We're not experts at dealing with the phenomena. And, and I think that the struggle for us in the center is to actually keep it transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary. And, um, and that's for me something I think pretty central, but that sometimes we are the problem. Um, and and, I, and I, as we quote, construct problems out there. So um, let me say a couple of things about um, risk. And one of them is this notion that uh, risk and resilience um, are not necessarily compelling subjects of conversation for people. Um, and that somehow um, one of the things that we need to recognize also is that risk and conversations about risks are uh, distributed and equally. Uh, so I was listening this morning, and I'm glad that you know, we come in the afternoon after the, the, the panels in the morning. The chief of police in Boston says, you know, if you see something, say something. Well, if you see something, say something. Cognitively, it's processed in a very different way by very different communities. And that's true internationally, too. This issue that is transversed by uh, the question of trust. Uh, that message that seemed to be, that makes sense. It's sort of like, we, who, who doesn't support resilience, right? Well, who, does, who doesn't support, if you see something, say something, can be pre and even. Um, so uh, let me talk about a couple of projects, and, and, and I will say some ideas about it. But first, let me say something about um, this particular diagram there. Uh, I'm not going to go through it. This is, there's no piece significance or any of that kind of thing. But basically, we've been um, trying to figure out with a group of us how do we define resilience? And let me emphasize here, you know, we, we know the classical thing about bouncing back and bouncing forward, and we know some of the complexities of that, and we know also that that is not necessarily all what we need to do. And, and I think that the, 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 in the same way that you, you, you spoke a lot about how sectors can coordinate, I think that what we need to really internalize is this notion that the distribution um, is unequal. That somehow uh, 
out of a, a natural, uh, you know, extreme natural event, for instance, uh, or even climate change adaptation, et cetera, that people are subjected to very different consequences related to that. And that most of our programs or ideas are not necessarily thought out in those terms. So I just want to say that in a way, people and their territory are not in equal terms and that we need to think about equity when we think about resilience. Um, so two uh, projects in which I've been involved and been leading, one is to develop how can we think about crisis platforms? That is, how do we think about people informing themselves but also sharing what they're living during a crisis is something that I've been you know, uh, very interested in. So how do they develop a platform for a crisis? And there are many of them out there. But the big problem with crisis platforms out there, there's about 100 or something that we review, is that they actually do not pay much emphasis to the notion of participation. So in a way, even though in a way the center has been on computing how we you know, process the data, but not in how is it that people can contribute to the data and how they can use it, and how they can actually interact with others. So here, there's a prototype of something that we've been developing in terms of you know, how do we deal with rumors, for instance? How do we actually have not only the emergency managers sort of trying to deal with the rumor, and you know, in the morning we heard um, the mayor, no, not the mayor, the um, judge telling us, if, I don't know who said it actually, if you're, if you're, uh, the, the way to deal with is in social media is to be in there and to actually act now. Well, people will do it anyway, and so I think we need to provide some tools for actually people interacting more efficiently. For instance, how do we volunteer, how do we donate, how do we go to places, and those kinds of things, because people are going to do it anyway. And finally, oops. Um, I'm okay. I was gonna. That's not mine. Um, yeah, I fly a lot, but not. Uh, can you can you go to the second slide? The, the first. Sorry, the first slide. The first slide. Yeah, that one. So this is a question for another project that we're working on, and, and the idea will be: imagine that every neighborhood were to have a team of people who would actually activate themselves during a, a, you know a crisis and we're able to fly a drone. Um, what, what would it mean in terms of actually maybe responding better, preparing themselves better, helping to mitigate the impact of the event, et cetera? So we have embarked, and I was going to show you a video, which is uh, much more better than my um, bad English. Uh, it's basically the notion of how, what are the kinds of things that we will need to do. And what we've been engaged is in actually using drones to engage with community to actually perceive and look at their territory from above. And it's been very interesting in a way, I think that people rediscover, you know, not only the areas in which there are risk, but also what are the places in which there might be safe. And and I think that more than the actual objective outcome, it's actually the process of actually doing this. That is, how is it that in some way, by having conversations um, that in some way are driven by the attraction to these new media, drones or cameras, can, they can lead us to actually have this real conversation so that risk and resilience become compelling subjects. I will bring you back to basics. <laughs> Completely uh, different perspective. Going back to away from technology and thinking at this level. Just go back to the very basics, as well as going back from natural disaster to man-made disasters. Iraq, what should I say? You know. <laughs> since the 80s or even before that, almost four decades of continuous war and stability. That brought a huge uh, impact on human being as, as a person, as a personality, complicated by impact of environment also. So not even the person is faced with the difficulty of facing and 
being resilient against war and how they manage their individual life, family life, and the community life. Environment also comes adding to the mix. Make it is almost impossible. Uh, my experience with this is really uh, being from the community, but looking also from outside. I left Iraq since 91, and then when I came back to the community, I didn't feel I am belong to the community because what I see, not even with my immediate family, I feel that war changed them a lot, changed their behavior. So, I mean, uh, I'm not justifying anything, but I am just expressing my individual feeling with my closest family as well as what I see with the community. People are not interested in taking care of not themselves or their environment. So that's why we are in Iraq being in a very catastrophic situation where everything is collapsing. Not the community is able to do anything because I feel uh, they feel a lot of stress. So if we look at what war, water, and culture, those are three kind of relationship, some man-made, others are man-made and environment, and then looking at the history. If this is what I presented just recently to students from Northeastern. Do you know Iraq? I mean, many of the young people, they don't know. If I talk about history, do you know Babylon and Sumerian? Then it might strike something. So I say people of 7,000 years of culture and history and, you know, the, the, what Wikipedia used to say, beginning of the writing, inventing of the wheel, the agriculture and everything used to be there. Look how it looks now compared to this history and culture. This is a British uh, reporter, photographer, lived a year with the people. I'm just giving an example, one simple example of the Marsh Arabs. A marsh area where was struck by environment and a human man-made disaster. It was dried by the previous regime to uh, flush out rebellions against them. So it's completely dried. After 2003, Iraqi government with international agencies and different uh, uh, organizations tried to revive the environment. But the planning, how was that done? It came from like what you are experiencing and seeing and the process that you go through as Westerner, this is how it should be done. While people were in isolation for 40 years, the process for them of these issues is completely different. And when you come and you try the good and you want to do the good, but it's not what the community understand. And so there is a lag between what they should do or how they want to do it compared to what international organization with limited time, limited funding, and they want to do it. It's from their, the, their heart. I know I see uh, people who are volunteering, who are bringing you know, money, equipment, research, and science, and they want to do it, and they rush it. It will, it, it's, it will not happen like this. So this is the issue for us, and that's why we are struggling from 2003 up till now, almost 15 years now, and Iraq hasn't settled. Of course, because of all these sections or part, environment issues, human being development, culture, awareness, all of these working all together and not bringing the uh, improvement of the situation. While on individual basis, you see people pick up and go about 
you know, doing their life, and life is continuing. It's not stopping. Education system is there, even though it's not as we expect and want to be, but it is there at least. Health-wise, people's lives and people are reproducing. The number of the population is increasing. So th they have some resiliency, but they are doing it their way. And so if this is happening here, and you will see the, the barren, dry land, and the culture is almost desiccated, it's almost disappearing. How can we maintain the system? And who will come and assist and have the patient and time and money, of course, to do that? This is how the situation is now. So it's, it's compelling. It's, uh, how can we go back? Sorry, I just dropped one. So this is, again, where I was talking about technology and basic of how to maintain. We are talking about the drones, about the processes. While if we look at building a simple bridge from the culture, the community have the clay bridge, and they were happily, if it broke, if something happened, they will repair it themselves. They don't need any assistance. While the government, from their the good heart, and they want to bring something new, they try to build metal bridge. But building these bridges with no maintenance, if it break, what will happen? It will continue like this. Children drawn of these even small rivers and die, and the, gover uh, the uh, population wait for someone to come and repair. While if it was the, the one that they know of, it's part of their what are used to, they will repair it and they go by their lives and continue doing this. So the issue is when an organization that comes which uh, want to assist in the development, they need to look at the culture and community perspective and that will bring it better understanding to the, to the culture. Thank you so much. Mm. It's actually a really great pleasure, and Nadia is a tough act to follow, um, to be to bring the practitioner perspective to this panel. Um, I'm also really pleased that we have some additional FEMA folks who are here this week, and I, um, I for this event, I just want to point out Natalie Onclod back in the back. Can you wave your wave your hand? So um, Natalie has just come on board at FEMA as our new director of individual and community preparedness, and so I hope that you track her down. Uh, in addition to talking to me and some of our other colleagues who are here um, about ways that your research can inform the work that her organization is doing because she really leads the charge on uh, creating a culture of preparedness, is, which is one of our strategic plan goals. Um, I think, as you all know, it's an understatement that 2017 was uh, a big year for emergency management, and it was certainly a record-setting year for FEMA. Uh, we are actively in the midst of doing our after-action review of the 2017 hurricane season um, and have already incorporated some of that information um, into our new strategic plan. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our strategic plan today because um, I think it tees up a lot of interesting research questions and places where we could really really use the academic perspective to inform um, the improvements and the change management that we're trying to implement at FEMA. Um, so it couldn't be better timing to talk about risk. Um, so this is a copy of our new five-year strategic plan. And um, it has three goals and 12 objectives, which are listed up here. And the three goals are actually very simple. They're very easy to remember. Um, but what I really love about this plan is our new administrator, Brock Long, has really made a point to emphasize that this is not FEMA's strategic plan. This is everyone's strategic plan. And in fact, on the cover page, he, it was really important for us to not just have FEMA on the cover page, but also all of the partners that we work with, um, including individuals and communities. And I would include the academic community as being a critical partner um, in the work that we do. So I'll briefly just talk about the goals and some of the questions that they raise um, that I hope some of you can help us answer. So the first goal is to create a culture of preparedness. And to me, that, that takeaway is that 
really everyone is a risk manager. Um, that's individuals, that's communities, that's senior leaders and organizations. And, and so how do you incentivize people, and I think we've been talking a lot today already about barriers, how do you incentivize people to take, um, to take action but also recognizing that we're never going to be able to reduce all risk. Uh, Robin and I were talking about risk tolerance uh, earlier in the day today. And so if, if we have to accept some risks, what are the risks that we're willing to accept? And what are the ones that are the most critical to address in, um, in our preparedness actions to build resilience? Uh, the second goal is really to ready the nation for catastrophic disasters. And really, that's a primary mission of FEMA, which is to um, ensure that the nation is ready for that worst case day. Um, but we can only really do that if the capability and the capacity with our state, local, tribal, territorial, and frankly, individuals have the, have the ability to be resilient to small and medium term disasters. So we can really focus on those type of um, you know, worst day scenarios. And finally, our third goal, and one I think that is uh, near and dear to my heart, and um, Judge Emmett's comments about recovery were really um, apropos for this one, is we're really working hard to reduce the complexity of FEMA. Um, our administrator has said again and again, we've got to figure out to make uh, ways to make our policies, our programs, our, individual, our, our uh, internal business processes more simple so that um, it makes it easier for survivors to navigate those programs and policies and to actually be served um, by the services that we provide. So I'll just talk briefly about building a culture of preparedness given the time constraints, just tee up a couple of things. Um, so from a practitioner perspective, it, success for creating a culture of preparedness would be if everyone on a daily basis just sort of inherently thought about preparedness and resilience and incorporated that into their, their daily practices. And FEMA actually does some research on this. Um, so we have a FEMA national household survey uh, that looks around across 5,000 respondents about different preparedness activities. And just, you know, just a couple of uh, numbers from that that I think are worth mentioning. So on the good news side, over 90% of US adults in, in 2016 reported they'd taken at least one of six preparedness actions to prepare for a potential disaster. That needle has moved up 13% or 14% since 2013, so that's a good news story. But on the flip side, less than half actually have an emergency plan. How many of you have an emergency plan? I won't make you raise your hand. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass the other half who don't have them. <laughs> um, but I think it shows us that there's, there's still room for improvement here. Um, and one of the pieces that I'd love to hear this group talk about more is how do we also broaden the way that we think about preparedness? Um, one of the new things that Brock Long, our administrator, talks about is that just having bottled water for three days in your house does not make you resilient. You also need to have <laughs> financial resilience. Um, you know, our strap plan mentions that over 40% of Americans can't put enough hands on uh, enough cash to deal with a sudden unexpected uh, expense. So if you're trying to build resilience in a resource constrained environment, what are the most critical low cost or no cost things that, um, that individuals can do to, to build their resilience if they can't do sort of the, the gold standard uh, preparedness activities? And so I'll, I'll leave it there and, and leave that as food for thought as we move into our discussion. I, I think a lot of what I'm gonna say is, is gonna mirror um, what my co-panelists have said. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about unintended consequences, particularly from the viewpoint of the ecosystems in which we, we live, whether we recognize it or not. So I just want to give a, a case study. This is a project that I'm doing with, with Mark Patterson and Loretta Fernandez here at Northeastern. And it's looking at, at tide gates. Tide gates are one of those um, unrecognized pieces of infrastructure that are worldwide that um, prevent flooding um, uh, globally, yet we don't even recognize where they all are in New England right now. Tide gates essentially um, form a temporary barrier, a barrier that can be opened um, between the ocean and, and salt marshes. In many cases, these were built centuries and centuries ago, so we've, we've lost them. Um, they, uh, the reason why we have them there instead of just having dams or barriers is to maintain the salt marshes. So when they're open, um, they maintain the, the health of the salt marsh. Um, they are habitat here for things like winter flounder. Um, and so when they're operating, um, they maintain healthy marshes. Problem is, um, they don't always operate well. So uh, what we've seen here recently, and this is from a, a town of Revere just to the north of here, is either when they're vandalized or when they, they're not shut in time um, due to storm surge, we get catastrophic flooding. 
what the result of that is, is that managers typically will just go out and just shut them. They'll just leave them shut so that um, no one's going to get under case about flooding. Problem with that is when you shut the gate, all of a sudden fresh water starts pouring into the salt marsh um, and an invasive grass called Phragmites moves in. It changes the entire structure of the ecosystem and from the human perspective, Phragmites is incredibly flammable. So here the, the commuter rail goes right through the middle of this, this marsh, so as soon as sparks come off the rail, fires start. So your choice if you're a resident on one of these marshes is do you want your house to flood or do you want your house to burn down? Um, so we're trying to come up with solutions to this um, using decision support tools. So we're using a series of ecological models, and we'll go into the details of this, but basically how long do we have to keep these gates open in order to maintain ecosystem services, in order to keep a healthy marsh, yet shut it in time to prevent flooding, um, but also to prevent fire. Um, and so you know, the end result of this is, is we're making these fancy decision support tools, and we're going to have apps, and we're going to have um, uh, all sorts of, of neat toys that, that um, the person who has to go out in the pickup truck and shut the gate can, can use. So here's the problem, and I think this reflects a lot of what we've been hearing so far, is we can make these great tools, but what's to say that this person who has to go out in the truck to, to close the gate is actually going to use this thing? So the other piece of, of what our group is, is looking at is, is how do we not only communicate risk, but how do we do this in a participatory way? How do we go into the community, find out what their biases are, find out what their priorities are, get them to think um, from the viewpoint of, of somebody else, and involve them in the process of planning so that the, the ground is softened, so that they're ready to use some of these decision support tools. So I just want to quickly walk you through a, a project that we're doing in collaboration here with the Museum of Science Boston, um, with Arizona State University. It's, it's funded by NOAA. And at the beginning of the morning here, we heard about gaming and, and the, um, the role that serious games can play in getting people to understand risk before it, it happens. So this is just a, a board game. Um, it's a board game where we are looking at four different climate-related hazards. So we look at sea level rise, we look at extreme precipitation, we look at drought, and we look at extreme heat. In all these cases, we start by presenting users with um, stakeholders. So we create these elaborate backstories behind them. So you know, this is an emergency room doctor. Um, he not only cares about um, his patients, but he also likes to go fishing. Um, we have a single mom who's mostly caring about her kids. You get the idea. But what we ask the participants to do, and what we've done is we've brought in about 100 people at a time um, to the museum. Um, we break them up into groups of six, and we say, all right, Think about the world from the viewpoint of these different stakeholders. Um, if we presented you with different solutions to this challenge, so in this case, the one you're looking at is for sea level rise. And the three broad categories are, do we keep the water out? Do we build a dam? Um, do we live with water? Do we have um, temporary storage for water? Or do we have managed retreat? What would each of these people think about this different strategy? And we have them prioritize this across the map. And, and you know, what always happens is no one's ever in agreement about what the perfect strategy is, because it all depends on what your priorities are. What we then ask them to do is to come back and say, all right, taking into account the needs of all these different stakeholders, what management plan would you come up with in a finite resource world? And in our world, the finite resources are poker chips. So we give them three poker chips, and we say, you can spread these out any way you want. You can invest in a large, expensive plan A, um, but you can only do this for one of them. You may have some funds over, left over for plan B that, that's a smaller amount. Or you can kind of do the, the smattering across these three things. So they make their choices. Um, and what we've been spending most of our time on is helping people understand the consequences of those choices, especially those unintended consequences that are often difficult to see because of all these complexities that we've been talking about. Um, and we all know, I mean, no one's going to want to sit in a lecture uh, to understand the impacts of water flow on winter flounder unless you're a geek like me. So the way we do this is we create virtual reality worlds. Uh, we create um, landscapes where we tell stories using narrative. We have newspaper stories where, for example, you have built a barrier across the, the river. 
it's great, you've reduced flooding, we can show you where you've reduced flooding, but now the tourism industry is left, all the cruise ships are left because you can no longer get your ships in there. Um, you may have protected some of the areas where the wealthiest businesses are, but now you have flooded local schools. And we do this through stories, we do this through narratives, um, and also through these kind of street level visualizations where you can see your favorite landmark flooded um, using Photoshop. Um, uh, but the idea is that by getting people to interact with this game, um, it's, a, it's a safe environment. We, we've, we've done versions both where we use local landmarks, where we've done this for the city of Boston, but we also do it for areas that are, are distant, so, so people aren't trying to protect their little corner of the world. Um, this is, uh, I can't remember, I think it's maybe Charleston, South Carolina. Um, we don't tell them that. Um, but uh, what we found is, and in, in we've done surveys before and afterwards, is, is people have much more of a sense of participation, much more of a sense of ownership in the plan they, they come up with. And in several cases, we've had local government agencies participate in this, observing it, so that they, in turn, can, um, can have a better sense of, of what the priorities of their, um, their constituents are. And, and the, the goal of this is we're actually replicating this at nine different um, science museums across the, the U.S. as well. Again, each tailored for local threats and for the local government structure. And so um, I, th I think this fits well with everything we're saying here is, you know, how do we come up with clever ways of getting people to feel like they are part of the solution rather than just victims who are um, episodically imposed upon by the government? two things I think, I'd, um, having not thought about this at all, the two things would be uh, how to engage better with the process of connecting communities and sometimes reconnecting communities mm -hmm. because at the back end of an event uh, in recovery sometimes communities actually fall apart rather than coming together um, and how that works we just don't, I don't think we understand. Um, and the second and uh, important part for many of our countries is how to build um, government and private partnerships that work because those two partners don't often understand um, each other's needs um, and uh, some of the liabilities and so on that are associated with their work. So public-private partnerships would be the other one. I think that you know academia has crazy incentives throughout the career we do since from the beginning. Um, from undergrad all the way to becoming a full professor or whatever. I, I think the incentives for how to do research and what success means and all that is sort of like opposite to what we might need in terms of collaborating, listening to what people really want to do. I mean, think about those ethics committee, which are a good thing, but what do they do in terms of actually, how do you do research with those constraints, the funding, um, et cetera. So, so in a way, we have to change the way we think about not just internal validity, but real external validity. And I think that most of the incentives are 95% around internal validity. Most of the studies, no one reads them besides those who are quoting them, et cetera. So that, that's one thing. The other one in that sense, I think, is to figure out how to communicate better as you listen. For instance, I'm engaged right now in creating a graphic novel. Um, where we hope to have some content that is educational, but at the same time, it is appealing from a more artistic side, so that it is embraced by popular culture. I think that we, you know, we make this huge, I mean, I, I think that we might learn more in the context of popular culture in a movie. I mean, think about disaster movies. They're terrible. <laughs> Why is it that we cannot have a good disaster movie, right? <laughs> It's a disaster. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm being serious, uh, but you get the message, right? Why is it there's not a good Netflix series about the kind of work we do? I'm, I'm serious. I mean, someone has to figure it out. Mm. I agree. I mean, with uh, back to root, to basics, I think it's um, teaching communities, educating them on using these words and understand them. I mean, in our situation, as you said, not spelling resilience, but even thinking of such technical words is very difficult. Um, I was talking to my colleagues here before, and I say, 
I think even for me, for us in Iraq, before going to community, we need to educate our leaders, our politicians, to accept and understand these changes. Because even with supposed to be democracy and electing these people, they have, anyway, they have no concept of what is democracy or even how to think of leading communities into, into a safer place. Because there is a, a disconnect. So first of all, bring the connection between politicians and the communities, as well as working with the ground level. This is what we are trying to do, is learning from here. Actually, I'm thinking of going to my student, my immediate uh, group of people is to talk about such things and to start to, even with a small thing with us, within our uh, immediate student, to implement some of these things, some of these ideas, and how for them to perceive it and take it, again, expand it to their um, relationship and their surroundings. So it is a learning experience for me first, and then I will take it to the others. So I'll give one answer with my policy hat on and one with um, a preparedness hat on. Um, from a policy perspective, I was really struck by Dr. Contoro's um, discussion about the four-year term that he had with after Ache, and that he did that explicitly so that it was putting a time limit on the support and really then giving the community a goal of where they're going to build back self-sufficiency and, and know that they have sort of a timeline for their capacity building and capability building. Um, I think what I would love for, from academia is to know, you know, what, what are those incentive structures, whether it's using gaming theory or, you know, games or, or other different um, mechanisms to study that, how can we simplify um, federal policy, state policy, or even local policy to, to really get <clears throat> folks to actually um, take on the resilience cause in their individual lives. So that's sort of my, my policy one. Um, from a preparedness perspective, I'm, I'm going to keep um, going back to the financial preparedness piece. Um, what, what, how do we, if people are doing things that in a resource constrained environment that are not actually contributing to the most risk redu reduction, how do we frame that messaging and do that communication so that they actually prioritize the things that will make the most cost benefit um, sense uh, for them uh, if they can't do everything? So those would be my two. It's a disadvantage of going last, is all the good ideas have been taken. <laughs> um, I, I guess I would turn it around and say um, the limitation is, is not the kinds of research we can do, but um, as Gonzalo said, the incentives and how we think about doing it. And I want to look at it from, from both perspectives. I mean, the first is we think a lot about shifting baselines, which is just another way of saying kind of the, the long emergency, that a lot of the crises we find ourselves in are slow in the making, but because we're always dealing with the immediate, we're always dealing with the, the short-term crises, we're ignoring those which happen over longer time scales, and that's really difficult to, to communicate. Um, but oftentimes, that's what's kind of coming towards the, the scientific community for, for solutions, where you know, lots of things we study are, are much longer in, in time horizon, um, yet implementing those is, is difficult in the, in the policy arena. Um, so I think coming from the kind of practitioner side and policy side, you know, how do we um, embed the idea that, you know, even though the roof is on fire, we still have to deal with the fact that the foundation is, is crumbling. On the other side, though, I mean, I think as academics, sometimes we are too enamored with being clever and with being novel. I mean, this is driven by funding, right? I mean, we have to prove the novelty of what we're doing. It has to be cutting edge science because that's what's going to get funded, even though oftentimes what we're trying to do is find cutting edge science to solve real world problems. And you know, as Nadia was saying, in, in many cases, the best solutions aren't going to be something that is completely novel and new and clever. It's going to be putting it together in different ways that address the immediate problem. And so somehow, I think we have to, and this is within academia, change the culture and the incentive systems so that we're not constantly trying to find the, the new shiny thing, but, but putting it together in ways that solve real world problems that practitioners face. Can Oh, I was going to react to the notion that do policymakers follow what we do? 
<laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, I'm just yeah. want to point out that it's not so. They have trading cards, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I can respond to that a little bit because um, uh, we've spent a lot of time developing scorecards, uh, balanced scorecards in the sense that we don't want communities to go through a process of accurately determining the measurement of their resilience. But a balanced scorecard approach has been quite useful in Australia for communities to more or less reach consensus about where they sit in certain domains of resilience and for the community to do that itself. So I think that helps them then make decisions about what their strategy will be and where they will spend their dollars in the next period and then come back and do that review again at the end. So I think that's a kind of decision support tool. That was funded by policymakers, I have to say, um, because it was their idea, so that was great. Um, and uh, so there's some support there, I think, uh, for you. Um, so that's one of those things. The second one uh, example is um, in the complex cascading space where um, we've been, in a, in a very early way, trying to develop um, dashboard systems that will help uh, people, for example, running a health system to identify the status of different parts of their dependent system during an emergency. So they can have a sense of what their pharmacy supply is like in order that they can run their theatres, in order that they can deal with mass casualties and so on and so on, and get that picture in what is a relatively complex or complicated uh, system. So some of those sorts of things are useful. Hi, I'm Roger Sorkin with the American Resilience Project. Um, please forgive me, this is going to sound like a shameless plug for our work. Um, it, it, it probably is, but my main motivation is to let you know that we're out there so that we can help you do the work that you're doing. That's why we do our work. And what we do is film, film and other communications. We're storytellers. We try to harness the power of story, coming up with what we consider to be strategic narratives. So working with NGOs, researchers, elected officials, other policymakers, to fi and of course, a lot of grassroots advocacy folks, figure out what is the goal that we need to achieve What's the story that's going to get us there? Who are the storytellers that need to convey the message? Because we know that the storyteller is a critical component. Um, so I just want you to know that we're out there and we're looking to work with folks like you so we can take your sometimes abstract data uh, that is difficult for the layperson to get their minds around and stitch that into a strategic narrative that we can all use uh, to get to a common goal. And, and just to give you a quick example, the current project that we're working on is looking at electric grid resilience, the, the idea that we need to transform the grid. And in order to do that, we need to bring together the interests of the auto and utilities industries. Of course, you can't overlook defense and technology industries as well. But if any of those entities are working against each other, then we're going to have gridlock and we're not going to get what we need to be done. Uh, so I just want you to know that, that we're here, us storytellers, us filmmakers. Um, please come find me if you want to talk about this some more. I'm very intrigued by the idea of a graphic novel. Um, we're not just looking at film, but other communications tools. Um, so uh, I just can't, you know, I'm, I'm an evangelist for the power of story. Um, and I, I just want you to know that we're out there and we're, we're looking to serve. So uh, thank you. I have, I have no question, but I just wanted to let you know that. We do resilient solar powered lighting used in many different applications, municipal and industrial. Um, and I was struck by a comment that, that Nadia had made about how she had come here to see how we do things, how other people do things. And I'm curious where, if you look at Iraq and other areas across the world, um, uh, where there are communities that are very used to being resilient, um, much more so than we ha we are here in in the United States and other you know developed countries, and um, uh, to what degree are we studying countries like Iraq or Syria or you know places in Africa and Indonesia and the like to help us learn and develop uh, resilient policies. And perhaps there are things that are going on, and I've heard of such studies going on, where uh, they've, you know, countries have or, or communities have leapfrogged technology that, in, in, you know, by using wireless versus landlines and the like, um, have developed their own set of, of resilient and distributed um, solutions. 
Yeah. Uh, I am aware of few papers, policy papers, foreigners who did look at resilience in Iraq specifically uh, on how they uh, adapted themselves towards lacking of everything, almost everything. And uh, there are few papers which are from US. They were really good. Actually, we didn't, we didn't read, read it ourselves that we are resilient and adaptive at that time. But when you look at it in the paper, you, will, you see that re, uh, people were modifying the way that they were doing. Because uh, if they have uh, no access uh, to spare parts, they go and do things that from, I don't know, from something that is really out of your mind, you think about it, and they work it out, and it worked. Similar to health, to education, to every part of their life, and uh, researchers came and did this, and we didn't call it anything except, you know, go on living. We didn't give it a word, but it seems that we, we are doing something good. So here you go. Thank you. So uh, can I add one quick thing to that? So I really appreciated that question. Um, in fact, that's part of the reason we have some extra FEMA folks here. So I don't know, where's, there's Jacob. Jacob, raise your hand. So Jacob Vodder is with our office. In addition to doing policy and program analysis, um, our office is also in charge of international affairs for FEMA. One of the main impetuses for us participating in this was we want to do more pulling from the international community on um, lessons learned, things that we can use to inform um, building a culture of preparedness here in the US. Um, and so please find us and, and share those, um, those research studies or, or, or countries where you know that there is good stuff happening, because uh, we're hungry for that type of information. Thank you so much. My name is Marla Perez Lugo and I am from University of Puerto Rico. And um, I apologize in advance if my, if my thoughts are not well organized, but your intervention and Mr. Fear's intervention obviously touch very close to home. Um, and let me start by saying that I'm very glad that FEMA is reflecting on the last hurricane season, because maybe the appalling uh, response of FEMA in Puerto Rico might lead to some developments, very good developments in disaster response. And um, given that trust has been a major theme in some of our interventions, I'm wondering what role does trust building play in your plan? Um, when Part of being resilient, you know, from sociologist to sociologist, yeah. uh, part of being resilient at the individual level is trusting the institutions that your society have in place to help you respond and recover from a situation like this. What can you learn from the breakage of that trust between the Puerto Rican society and FEMA? How is that rebuilding of trust built into your plan? What happens when the major limitation to individual resilience is the very structure of the institution that is supposed to help you survive and recover? And I don't mean any disrespect. I really, really looking forward to your response on this. So I actually am so happy. In fact, Jacob and I were talking. I've been looking for all of the, the professors from Puerto Rico because I actually wanted to, to talk to all of you today. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, because I think you're absolutely right. So one of the objectives in our culture of preparedness is continuous, prov continuous process improvement and learning. Um, and I think that the, there's a lot to learn from the Puerto Rico example, and, and trust is one of those pieces. And I think to build institutional trust, you have to first build individual relationships one-on-one -on -one to, to rebuild those bonds. And so um, one of the things that I was very much hoping to talk to all of you today is about what, what role the University of Puerto Rico is playing in the recovery, and if we haven't plugged you in in the right ways, 
how can we make that happen um, to ensure that your voices are heard? Because I was particularly interested in your uh, particular expertise in the energy sector because of the way that we're doing recovery in Puerto Rico is very much a sector-based approach. Um, so, so my answer is that I really think it starts at the, with those individual one-on-one -on -one relationships and that it actually has to build back up, that it can't be a top-down solution. Um, and we'd be thrilled to hear more about your thoughts on that and, and, and also to talk more after this panel. How much time do you have? <laughs> I've got all day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.